So what are you going to do? Ask people to step in the train when we're still No, no. But you only have the whole thing. Oh, you still have to move. 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 You still have to topic 
and people get um, very focused on making sure they're heard. We're taking minutes and we're videotaping it. So let's utilize the time to make sure everyone's comments can be heard in their entirety. Um, and so with that, we're gonna, do anybody on this board have anything they wanna say before we open the floor? You're good? I think so. Okay. <laughs> but um, maybe one of the things we should start with is the, well, that's for us anyway. That's the Point Roberts Taxpayers Association review of their their desire that the merge and purge and not you yeah. know not to dis, uh, dis decimate that whole 204 like the chamber of commerce yeah. suggested that's what we start holding our different ideas like yeah that, that sort of okay <laughs> so we're going to open the floor to public comment uh -huh. who would like to go first <laughs> george uh -huh. Bye, okay folks here it goes we got three minutes um David gave you some information on, I guess it was Thursday, wherever that email came from, it went out, so got an email from David, whatever they got. Okay, so, okay, so, okay. Yeah, anyway, so it was an email. Basically, what's going on is, and some, we, this has been discussed before about the meetings. There was a, a, a Floyd Roberts sub area plan put together and submitted to the county in, in 2000, I guess. It was actually. In September of 2001, it was first approved. And then, like, the next day or something, 9 11 happened. I'm not sure how it coincided with the approval of the sub area plan. It was very close in there. And everybody knows that 9 11 put a serious crimp in what's going on in Point Roberts. It was devastating to a lot of people, to businesses, to all businesses. So that that plan, which is in this document right here, okay, it's very, very comprehensive. There's enough vision in this plan to last us for the rest of our lives. You can put enough, there's enough vision in here for three subject plans. The people that put this together were looking at very, very far future developments and things that they wanted to see. And they weren't restricting themselves as far as the width of the dream. So we have this document, the sub area plan, and it's been reapproved in 2017. So rather than try to look for a vision, we can pull from this. So we've already looked at it, we've already, it's already been approved. It's not going to be as restrictive as some people think it might need to be, but we don't have to use this except in the way we can revise it. It's a picture of what we want to see, what they wanted to see the people put this together. And it's very, very close. I would say 95% of this document is spot on for right now. The things that aren't spot on are the numbers. <coughs> the numbers what, how many people come in, the distances, all the stuff that has to do with the, the information the document was built on, that's changed, obviously. But the primary part of this document that's important is the fact that there is a broad, broad vision in here that we can use to make decisions for the zoning. The zoning is actually much more restricted in some ways than the document is pulled from. So I'm saying we don't have to do very much. If we look at the document, we read it, we see what's in there, we decide what we don't want to see anymore, what we do, we shouldn't have to labor over. My, my advice and my suggestion is read the document, see what it says, see if there's anything in there that doesn't appeal to you or doesn't look like it needs to happen now, and then we can go from there. We shouldn't have to work so hard. Great, great, thank you very much. Anyone else? Ken? Yeah, uh, looking at our small town commercial zonings and, and stuff like that, those actual zonings that we have through our commercial district here are the biggest restrictions other than the extras on 2072 that are ridiculous for limiting the potential for growth but in all of point roberts there is only four pieces of property five pieces that are uh even remotely geared for uh handling any heavy equipment even just for storage we 
We need them in this town because they're, you know, it's part of the construction needs to, to be able to do things. Um, right here, in, through our main commercial core, you, you cannot have commingled uh, living and uh, storefront. Storefront on the bottom, living on top, because it's not permitted in small small town commercial. Uh, general commercial, definitely. We do have two pieces right up as you come in the border. I believe Best Time RV or and the one just north of it between it and the border are our general commercial. Uh, but we also need like Whitby Tell sits on uh, R five, our local transfer station. And the county yard sits on R5. Our transfer station also sits on top of our aquifer that we're no longer using. But uh, there, there needs to be looked into proper zonings so that there is the ability for growth. Right now, we don't have it. And, and our restrictions on our commercial zones are some of the worst uh, properties, septic wise, for being able to develop, to develop them. They, they have poor soil, they, they don't have uh, adequate room for a septic, and the restrictions on where parking has to be in the back uh, on Gulf Road, and, and the setback on Tyee is, is uh, I believe, 50 feet for trying to develop a, a property there it, because of the zones and, and the overlay of 2072. I believe a lot more needs to be looked into. Unfortunately, I, I, I like what George says, we don't need to look into it too much, but I think we need to take a deeper look and try and find proper zoning to, to fit point Roberts so that we have a chance to vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any well, like George was saying, it's actually a really good sub area plan. The sub area plan in 2072 don't actually go together. The sub area plan says we need to promote hotels, bed and breakfasts, those types of industries, small community industries, you know, things like that. The 2072 says you can't have that. You know, in small town commercial, you can't have a bed and breakfast. So 2072 is impeding what the vision was. So they did have the part of, George is right, part of that vision that's in there is good for Point Roberts. But now we have this overlay that says, oh, well, we have this vision, but we're not going to let you do this business. There's also, like Ken was saying, with our zoning, if you look at the zoning map, the only parcel in the commercial district is the two at the top of Pai that are zoned actually appropriately. The marina is on resort commercial, which requires conditional use permit. The Shen Marina Marina cannot be in resort commercial. It has a conditional use permit. The boat storage, which is stated in 2072, is not allowed in resort commercial. It has to be in industrial. We have all of these things that we're having to get conditional use permits for that we require. We shouldn't need to do that. We need to actually look at our zoning, have it be appropriate for what we want and what is already existingly here, because it really doesn't make any sense that we have a marina that's obviously been there sitting on resort commercial property, it should be done appropriately. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're going to do this, let's do it right from the beginning so that in 20 years, our kids aren't going, why did they start this, but only did half of it? Like we're looking backwards at people Okay, you came up with this 20 years ago. What were you thinking? Why didn't you fix it right the first time? Let's take the time if we have the year. Let's get everything done. Let's get the sub area plan done. Let's get the zoning done. Let's make sure that we are looking at the whole vision, not just putting a band aid on something that we're concerned about right now. Okay, excellent point, which I want to um, respond. Uh, we actually don't have a year. Although well, the, we have, we've been told, we've been given a overview of the critical timeline we're going to refine this and actually get it onto a calendar of what needs to be done next 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 but we have to be completely done and have all of our recommendations submitted to the county by august 31st this year so april may june july august we have five months i agree with you that as you that it's simpler if we 
remember that we already have a vision. And not wait, because I think uh, to create a vision like this, they need an, an economic development plan and things that are very costly and very time consuming, which we don't have the luxury of having right now. Um, so it should be simple. Um, I like what you're saying, Alison. I just don't know how. I just, I'm really feeling there's, it's a short time window, and I think we should fix what's wrong and then maybe look at rebuilding the text amendments. Well, this is the only text amendment we're allowed to make. This is just the one that the county has offered to help us through because of the, the merging of the, the guidelines, the design guidelines, and the outdated 2072, which has created a, a CDR nightmare here in the last couple of years. So, I mean, I love what you're saying. I just think that from my personal perspective, and I'm an at-large member, I don't represent an organization, um, I think we need to work on fixing, and I know it's a band-aid approach, which is not ideal, but in a very short time frame, I think we should first focus on fixing. Can I add that a little bit? Yeah. 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 Really, like, it was always intended, both the original charter plan and, and small town work, it was always intended by the county that this would be revised every so often. Some said in the original charter plan every couple of years, and I, I think that we, and, and I believe the flip from among others, I think, had said, um, yeah, you can come back to this in a couple of years. They don't want to see us back there with piecemeal every year necessarily. Why would they, if in two years there's things that we didn't fix, that we were like, oh, well, we have to do more, maybe we can do more then. So I would say a two year increment for rethinking it, we should do the best we can with what we can now, mm -hmm. and think 20 years ahead, 50 years ahead. But uh, it's really a good idea to uh, know that we, in two years, we could come back and do a little more. Maybe we don't have to revise them all, but a little more. So, I like that. I yeah. like the vision of it being a living document. Yes. You do Thank now, you. Yeah. and you know, as we all evolve, and all of our visions will evolve, that we stay focused on keeping it current and zoned appropriately. Mm -hmm. Great terminology there. Go ahead. So, in my work, I like to say that it's, the design is only as good as the requirements. And I think the station I'm hearing right now is to define what the requirements are. I've heard a lot of people say that 2072 is only back to Kanabi Road. I'm really glad to hear Ken lay out some specifics because I hadn't heard any specifics before about how he's doing that. I think to do this systematically and rigorously, it would be really good to gather a list of those specifics. What exactly is the problem? Where do people think <clears throat> the code is holding us back? What specific issues are there, like traffic and parking and you know, place for heavy equipment and stuff like that? I think the first thing to do is just make a list like that of all of the shortcomings that people currently see and start with that list rather than just hoping that enough people come to the meetings and give informal feedback and you say completed enough notes to capture anything. It would be really good, <clears throat> I think, if members of the community who have those concerns would know that they should put together their own list and send it to you guys so you can have something in writing and you can compile it all into one master list. Great suggestion. Do the hard stuff first. Do the hard stuff yeah. first. You know, we're, we're going to have to reach out because, uh, and right now, the, the forums that we have are Paws and Next Door and the newspaper. Um, we need to get that exact suggestion out there to the public, asking the public to find these documents, show them with links where they can read them, um, and, and pull what's important to them, and especially this compiled list of uh, inappropriately zoned, or I guess that's just the best terminology, inappropriately zoned, yeah, and where the restrictions are holding back economic development or otherwise. And then we can compile that list and work from there. Go ahead, Donna. I don't believe that cottage industry has been addressed yet. And it's been a while since I looked at all of these things, but I don't believe cottage industries are allowed in St. Roberts. And I think they should be. This is a community of entrepreneurs and creative people, and to restrict the use of their house, basically, from what I see, is commercial property. Is um, you know, it's not right for this community. Uh, I'm just going to. I've been studying the uh, permitted uses. I'm going to try to kind of develop documents. They developed a height document, and I developed 
developing still developing a document on permitted uses, which they have permitted uses, uh, permitted uses, accessory uses, and under conditional uh, use permits. And they do mention a lot on um, uh, cottage industry. I think there's a different term for it. And why the island um, zoning codes allow cottage industry? So I don't think you need height or whatever. It's just the permits. From what I've read in Point Roberts, it's just not allowed, except in commercial areas. That's not what I'm finding so far at all. Allison, what do you think? Uh, you're a residential, it's an accessory use. So it's an accessory use. Yeah, it's residential accessory use. Which means that, you help me out, Allison, it means that whatever your main use is, like a house, I have a house, let's say, that's your permanent use. And I have a, a room and I'm doing legal or software or something, and I'm doing it myself, and maybe a couple people visit. But I'm not handing it on a shingle, I don't have parking. It's not like a real business where a couple people are bringing it, exchanging money. But I'm working on jewelry, I'm working on leather craft, like in my, in my garage. Those are accessory uses and those are permitted. That's my understanding so far in our duty. Okay. But maybe it could be improved, see? We have people actually been, tell me, have people been um, uh, code violated or something like that? And this or is what that? I understand. And the thing is, it, it, you, what you're talking about is using an accessory as well. And the thing is that if you're doing it in your house, you can. You can. Is it yeah, an accessory? It's, it's, that's an accessory use of your house. But the thing is that you still have to go through the permitting process. So I, I don't know. Do you, do you have to, you said it, is that true? It's an open question. I don't I, know. What I am, like I said, it's been a while since I've read, mm -hmm. you know, the difference between a like island and us is there seems to be more for an island, which basically geographically are. And we need to consider that, as far as the point about the aquifer being underneath the garbage thing, is <coughs> our water rights run out in, five, in 15, less than 15 years. And what happens if Canada decides that they don't want to give us any more water? How are we going to provide our own water? We need to start looking at that issue here, too. Can the agenda be followed? We, yeah, we're going to stay on the agenda. Scope, the scope of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to suggest that Donnie, you do some more research on it. Has, had anyone, has anyone had trouble over this? Is it, a, 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 is it hard to get a, um, a business permit to uh, business license for that? I mean, um, so there's a perception there might be a problem. Well, this has it actually been? Okay. <coughs> Just looking at my, my house. And parking and all that kind of stuff, there's, there's no way for the size of my lot that I could have an accessory dwelling and parking for that accessory dwelling because of how the septic is all laid out. So, well, the Hermes business is a business that is it's inside your home. You work from your home. There cannot be more than two people that work at it. It's not a storefront. And you can't have a accessory building and right. accessory right. use. It's an accessory use of your home, mm -hmm. and there can be you and another employee. Okay. There's rules for that. So but if you can't have a storefront at your home. Well, yeah, you can ask it for that. Right, so you don't need additional parking or anything to that extent. It's just there. you're using it as an accessory use of your home, and they have rules that, you know, no more people. Okay, I'm, I'm just bringing. Yeah, it's a good point, and we'll look into it as we're revising the current code. And um, if it's a code that specifically prohibits such things, your point well taken that cottage industry should be it's something that you feel should be allowed in Point Roberts. And but I don't know of any. I don't know all the codes off the top of my head. So thank you for your point. Well, well, maybe what we should do is have our own definition of what's allowable in the cottage industry. I mean. Some of it relates to parking and, and number of people coming in cars and things like that. And the thing is that a, teen, a family with teenagers can have more cars than any industry. Okay, next. Go ahead, Justin. Um, I like the idea of having a list of what people's concerns are, like what they think is wrong with the zoning. Um, I think one of the a really good lists to have, um, which I started to do, would be a list of outcomes, so that 
um, any decisions aren't made in a vacuum without knowing uh, what, what kind of place we want to live in in the end. Um, so, so you can then you can analyze uh, um, uh, proposals, proposed changes as to how they might affect outcomes. So like, zoning is just basically to me it's a tool for outcomes. It's not in itself. It's not um, how you say a goal. It's what it can accomplish basically. And I think I think the problem we're planning from what I've seen in other communities breaks down is they end up doing a whole bunch of changes and they end up with an unlivable community. You can look across the border, you can look all around the world and see that now. Well, that's kind of the problem we have right now. We're having businesses that this community could not survive without being penalized because they don't have any proper permit in place they can store their equipment. Right. So, so that's what we're looking so, at. Now. So one of the outcomes would be that businesses can survive and can prosper. Mm -hmm. prosperous. Mm -hmm. Another outcome um, would be that we always have affordable housing for people to um, work in those businesses and with a lot of lifestyle as well. Another outcome would be um, that the community remains green, the forests are strong, they're not a tinderbox, um, uh, and, and so on. So I'd like to forward that list to you guys that I've been doing. And um, again, a lot of planning happens with a lot of lousy outcomes. Look across the border. We don't want to do that. We want to have exceptional outcomes. And I think we should uh, raise the bar on that part of it. And, um, and, and not, how do you say, belittle ourselves with our decisions so that our outcomes are anything short of exceptional. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, Pete. I was going to say, uh, Justin, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, um, the, the outreach program that we're trying to do on, uh, to some extent, sponsored by taxpayers, <laughs> and why it's different than the meetings, you know, to so explain to people in the meeting. That there are efforts to reach out and get them. Go ahead. Is it about 2072? Yeah. 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 yeah, let's put this way. These meetings are coming along that way. I mean, I am very <laughs> impressed with what's happening here today. You know, streaming and outreach and comments on email and, and really an inviting atmosphere of, of collaboration. I think that's what's been missing, actually. It's almost like a, a, a spiritual paradigm shift is what's actually been needed. And I think, I think we're seeing that now, like a kind of a willingness to accommodate each other rather than a pro or an against type uh, divisiveness um, that I've seen in a lot of the meetings. So the, the idea with um, uh, the outreach uh, database is that it um, identifies stakeholders. It, it does a bit of profiling, like it'll say whether someone's a visitor or whether someone has enough money to live on for the rest of their life or whether they want to, uh, you know, they've yet to uh, reach their potential, whether they're a homeowner. There's about 20 different categories of stakeholder profiling. And then what it does is it, um, it feeds information to those stakeholders, questions like, you know, um, do you want to see uh, 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 um, storage only, any more storage only allowed in Gulf Road? Yes or no. <coughs> if they say, no, if they say, no, we don't want to see storage only, then, then it could go to another level and say, well, would you be interested if the storage containers were uh, out of sight, if they were able to be used for cottage industries, if they were limited in their number, um, if they work in, in uh, uh, cooperation with other uh, personal and community development um, amenities, so, so it can kind of get really um, uh, detailed and inviting about asking people really, really what they want and really what they need. And, and again, the idea is not to try and get for or against, it's really about collaborative energy and, and to try and get, and my feeling is a lot of people, if they, you know, they say disagree or agree on, we, you know, they said we have so much more in common what are all these disagreements about? So I think it's really important that we, um, A, everyone knows what's happening. B, no complaints or concerns are, are, dis, uh, uh, are, are, are lessened by anyone. That you, you mine people's ideas and concerns in an inviting and respectful and collaborative and creative manner. And, <laughs> and, and, and it's called, then something else called um, interest combining. I kind of what's the name of this collaborative movement and you basically take people's interests rather than pit them against each other and make you vote on them, 
you, you actually combine them and you, you, you use the method called interest combining and uh, you make collaborative co-designs by, by this um, uh, activity. And my, my, my theory is that if we do this right, we'll have very, very little um, uh, split in the community, we'll have very little uh, resistance to change because everyone will know that they are not just, you know, lip service included, they are actually included and that everybody's uh, concerns are integrated in every solution, every design that we do. There's another name for it, it's called community co-design. And that, that's kind of the spirit where, where I'm coming from here. And I hope, I hope that's interesting to everybody. Thank you, Justin. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that is the spirit of the series of meetings where you can be able to gather those ideas and, and collaborate. Well, you have to you have to compromise in some situations. So. Co co you're kind of collating over the place. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay. And I know I'm seeing it. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful now that I see the spirit of this group and the different groups, how they're open to <laughs> Thank you, Justin. That's very helpful. Thank you. Just to, to build on that, I think <clears throat> the reason that a lot of these processes fail, they don't address all the problems, is that they combine defining the problem with defining the solution. So people propose ideas and solutions without necessarily understanding what the problems are. And then you don't really know if there's a problem or what the problem is exactly. I think in order to do this systematically and comprehensively, it would be good to sit do it in phases. So first of all, what is the problem? Define what the problem is we're trying to solve, or define what the problems are that we're trying to solve. Without thinking about what the solutions are necessary, I like the loop that Tom House and um, gave a few minutes ago. Something like that would be really good. Don't worry about the solutions until you understand what the problems are. And then, when you have agreement on what the problems are, then start talking about what the solutions are. Fabulous, great input, thank you so much. Um, so do you think about your, um, the voters meeting, we announced uh, the other night that the registered voters will be soon having some special meetings in which we will be doing educational on 2072, oh. where we have broken down the section of 2072, basically saying this is what 2072 says. If for some reason that was not there, this is what the county code says. So that people can actually have an understanding of what we're talking about what each section means, what it restricts, what it says, and if for some reason it wasn't there, what it would say. <laughs> so if you, we'll be putting that out on pause, point interface, next door, as soon as we start. There'll be a few different meetings for people to come in and get different educational, so at least you can be informed of what's going on. That's brilliant. Two, two dates? No. No. Well, we put the material together yet. Yeah. Yeah. We've actually had a good, good uh, essentially, Presentations and yes. texts and documentation together, and frankly, we've got to know more of that than we do in order to be able to help educate other people. About it. It's a lot. Did I yeah. guess? So there's four of us. Yeah, there's myself being right, and we're each taking. I've been trying to digest it for three yeah. years, and you know, every time I think I understand a particular point, somebody reminds me that this other code sort of dovetails and makes it a completely different definition. So um, I absolutely applaud the Voters Association for taking this so seriously. And my favorite part of what you said is educating the public so that they are making informed decisions. And uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. I'm going to go back to Heidi for just a second. Okay, George, go ahead, Heidi. Um, I, I love what the voters are doing too. And I wish that any other time we could have their meeting next week. And I hope it's exactly as good to help as well as the pastors. That work for the board, you might get a lot, and um, you can collaborate more. Like Justin said, a couple of things really that I've mentioned before I don't want more storage areas in the because we have enough. But in, in a collaborative way, like Justin said, I said, I need to do a percentage that I do get workers need to um, have space for their equipment and storage for their equipment so that maybe we could do a percentage wise on property. That may be a, um, a way to, to address some of those ideas rather than just say this could be a storage unit. One of the concerns I have is um, 
you need to take a step back there, you need to change the level of efficiency, you need quite a lot on the time sheet for a business to do in, in terms of just the expert. Um, but I really like the training agreements because I saw what these people do when they come in. So how can we um, address that so that areas that are already clear, maybe they can help be closer or like three areas on there can still be protected. Um, we saw some trees come, come down in the wind and you see more come down because of the, the bottom. Um, pedestrian areas, um, with, with some of the zoning um, requirements over the sidewalks and they kind of end. Um, could we somehow um, have uh, pedestrian areas that maybe can or hatch that we uh, around um, made of kind of <coughs> along the fronts that would work. Um, one of the concerns about pedestrians, I know with some of the walkers and stuff, we have huge black top areas that abut the off road, and there's no designated road maintenance for those users. Um, so um, going past them, it is difficult sometimes for walkers to know which way the car is going to go. Um, Long term, we have that as a huge issue. How, how do we help businesses realize that that's important to us? That's one thing more I'd like the conditional use request. If you guys want other oh, here, here, can you fix your bike here so this can be more pedestrian friendly? So there are some good reasons why people have to apply for conditional use permits. Uh, ben Rucker also, uh, I, I, I like the whole idea of live work, cottage industry. And those, those areas that Allison was talking about, making sure those can have their long walk um, close down, maybe we don't have aesthetic issues, um, are important. Uh, let's see what else. I think that's the question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All very good. Well thought out points. Thank you, Heidi. And back to you, George. Um, the whole point of education is extremely important. It's not like somebody, like when you're everybody standing up and saying, okay, kids, line up, here's what's going on. It's more a matter of explaining certain complex concepts and documents that we're dealing with. I mean, the, the Segaria plan is big. It's a lot of papers, a lot of sections. Everything you're speaking of, I mean, basically most of it in it is written into the Segaria plan as a plan. This is what we want to see. And this is from 2000. And in 2017, when it was redone, that sort of a replication of that approval. So what we need to do is to let people know as much as we possibly can in meetings like this or however else we do it, what the actual document says. I mean, it's dry reading. A person could fall asleep reading this thing, but the information is critical. And the same with 2072. If you don't read the document, you don't know what the it says, really. And some of the language is very confusing. A lawyer could eat some of these code statutes alive. You know, <laughs> I mean, some of this stuff is really, really um, iffy in terms of how it's written. You know, I'm an editor. I'm just, I'm, you know, I've got professional experience in writing. I would read this stuff and I go, this is going to get a, a minus D on an English test. So if we can look at the thing critically and look at these documents and and take the hard part first. I mentioned this earlier. When I get into a job, I take the most difficult aspect of it first and get that out of the road. Then I can take on the easier stuff. But it, we don't have that much difficult stuff to deal with, really. We talk about tree retention ordinances, all the things having to do with parking on the off road, all the things having to do with the little piece of code that's stripped on top of the off road that restricts down to everything. I mean, these are very straightforward fixes. Everything else, I think, 90% of it, the list is here. It's been highlighted. So if we can take what we're doing now, this is wonderful. By the way, I'm thanking everybody for being civil and clear that we really need to do what Brackenay's responsibility is, which is to gather this information Put it through the biocomputers of everybody sitting here. You go, okay, this is not going to be as difficult as you thought it might be in the beginning. And you're spot on. Five months is going to come really fast, early. So we don't really have a lot of time to spin our wheels on little details. If you have a question, specific question, as you did, about the thing with, with cottage industries, it's basically in the code. And if it needs to be a slight adjustment or 
some minor change in the language, that shouldn't be a difficult thing to do. But that's not the kind of decision that's restricting major, major changes on Gulf Road. So my position as a person who's worked a lot in his life on fixing things is to take the bottom end and come up. We need to be able to get as low as we can get into the dirt, into the infrastructure, and say, what can we really do about fixing primary problems? And we can build on that. And we don't have that many in terms of the, big, the vision that's in this document. There's a lot of ideas that have had no follow through over the ensuing years, and for various reasons. But that stuff is there for us to pull from. I'm into the ground, and that's where I'm going to start. And that's what my process is between with a point out 330, is to see what I can do with us to assist the community of Port Roberts in revitalizing and re renovating, essentially, Gulf Road and this Montana Commercial District, and it's a downtown. And it's huge. It's going to be expensive. It's no joke. But the vision that's in this document is already there. I mean, I'm looking at it going, hello, <laughs> there's no new ideas here that we're coming up with. They're all in this document. So taking what we have, working with it, grab the tools we have available to us, use the best brain power and most organizational skills we can put together, and we can, we can make it happen. <laughs> we're going to have to, folks, we're up five months. Okay. I think part of the problem is that some in between the lawyers who wrote the uh, law, mm -hmm. okay, they aren't seeing the vision that was in there. They were only, it, it, you know, it could be that they're at a council level and they're looking at their implementation. They wrote it. They weren't all lawyers. No, and the, no, I'm talking about those code no. changes were written by 2072 that was written. Well, the that lawyers was, that wasn't written, written by a bunch of people other than Point Roberts, so that was written by us. Yeah, the 2072 was written by Point These are yes. all changes yeah. to code that were written by Point Roberts mm -hmm. residents no. more than 20 years ago. Yeah. And so they're like humans are not infallible. They saw what was a, an immediate situation that they wanted. We've got to stop RVs, for instance. I know there was a, quite a push from uh, preservationists and real estate agents who wanted to preserve um, their vision, their personal vision of Point Robert. And property Robert, values. Property values, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there, there was code written about no RVs. Now, the, the code didn't get enforced. So as we later learned, people were putting in these darling little trailers, putting skirts on them, putting gardens all around them, putting a driveway up to them, making them beautiful little homes. And then somebody got their nippers in a knot in the last two years and called up the county and said, we want that law enforced. It was written 20 years ago. Um, and so and it was selectively enforced. Selectively enforced, but because they, they're not on an enforcement bandwagon, they're only responding to particular CDRs being filed by Point Roberts residents of today. So uh, George is right, all those coding changes were made by people like us. And so it's it's on us to fix what's hurting Point Roberts and to be kind in developing new codes for the future. Uh, let's start with Beck, okay? Justin, then you next. So I've heard inadequate storage for heavy equipment that's needed for services here. Um, parking and structure, a um, lot of availability interactions and how that is, is conflicting with code. Um, I'm curious about whether anyone else has any specific um, problems or specific ways that code is holding back people not to develop that. Well, we had 11 jobs disappear from the point because somebody decided to enforce a commercial application in an area that's zoned to that's uh, platted for residential. And that's the problem that we have here. What about the Gulf Road? Gulf Road. Most, most of the properties are, you know, 
residentially zoned? No, it's it's more kind of commercially zoned. Okay, I'm I'm talking uh, flat. Okay, the flat is residential, but we impose commercial zoning on them, and so by the ownership of the land, what you're restricted to do by the ownership, by the requirements on site accepted. We want to live in jobs because if somebody decided to enforce the code. Okay, well, we're going to come back to just talking about code revisions and not the. Um, I'm not sure I understand what 11 jobs were lost um, based on the enforcement. The container. The people you work for, I believe, is who she's talking about. The hemp, hemp business. Yeah. Okay, well, that business didn't leave town because of any enforcement issue. That's what I am. I'm the manager. I'm one of the jobs that left. Move on. Yeah. So we're gonna move on. But, um, George has just pulled out a zoning map, which is really, really helpful. And so um, you can see what uh, the whole point of ours is in the zone map. Um, well, that was the, what I understood. It, it was a different. It was what was what the land was available to do. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the conflict between the zoning and what land was available. There was definitely some zoning conflict there because Robbie wanted to expect. So I'll give you that. And there and some of the 2072 regulations were too stiff on them, um, which could have been worked around, but it was uh, more quicker and more economical for them to buy a turnkey business. Uh, building. Building. Zoned properly. Zoned properly. So that's how those jobs moved, but I agree. But I can yeah. call it Judson and come back to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to follow up on what yeah. Carl was saying. That sometimes it seems that these planning initiatives are done by you know planning departments or lawyers, like she's saying. And well, my research told me that the uh, the, the the great trend in planning is this thing called um, human-centered design, and it's used in product design now. Too. So it's not. So basically, you don't you don't look at the product through, say, an industry or a, a, an organization standpoint. You look at it through the experience of the user in the end, and you reverse engineer what you do in order to um, to result in that experience. Mm -hmm. So one of those experiences might be that a startup business comes in Point Roberts. Mm -hmm. It wants to be a low impact business that would have really great paying partnerships and jobs and so on, that they could come in here and and basically start up. That they could that we could facilitate startups. That could be uh, one of the, the human the, the centered outcome, the focused outcome. Um, so again, human centered design, not designed by outsiders, designed basically from the insider, you the, the user in the end. And, and to look at look at things from that point of view, because again, otherwise you can come up with all sorts of changes that don't really serve serve the um, the residents in this case. Okay. Uh, well, in general, I forgot the original point that I was talking about the zone here, but but uh, okay, it, it's very difficult for this organization, not this organization, for all three groups to come up with a vision. So like. I'm sure Vic understand this. You do bottom up and technology, bottom up design, top down design. Top down design is kind of like the boss or the, or the, the, the marketing guy wants, wants it, the widget to do this or that. Bottom up is, well, we need this kind of bolt or this kind of wire or this kind of piece of software. So they have to meet at the middle. And we're going to do the same thing. I mean, some people will be talking about code. Some people will be talking about, well, I like this kind of job, or this kind of business, but I wouldn't like that kind of business here. Yeah. For example, on the negative side, um, uh, not to not to pee on Guy Garbo, but does anyone want a second RV? And let's and this is an example. This is an example. A second RV storage facility like that, somewhere right along five years ago. I'm not saying it could happen, but what if it did happen? Is that what we really want? Even if it's screened, if it's back a ways and it's completely hidden, would we want that? These are very difficult decisions because all of us um, really feel. Like we kind of know what we want, but we don't want to tell this that you can't come here because we'd like to have more businesses. But it may come to that that, is, that some kinds of businesses we just don't want here. But what is the we in that case? How do we come up with some of that vision? Well, we have to try. It's imperfect, and we have to try. And I believe that the work that PRCAC has done 
is that is attempting to gather some of that vision and gather some of that code page and, 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 and create a, an ultimate document that will help with that and then have the ability to revise it in a few years if we make mistakes or we don't cover things. But we really uh, uh, um, can't just react to a business saying, well, I can't get in here. We have to think a little more globally, and that's what this is about. Is that what can we do? And we're going to make mistakes. I guarantee it. We're going to make mistakes because our predecessors made mistakes. You know, why did they not want more RV um, or, or mechanical shops on Gulf Road? Because they envisioned, uh, like Jim Julius said, you know, he worked on the original trucking line. He was thinking this is going to be like Pebble Beach. This is going to be this beautiful community, which it could be, but that's I don't think anyone thinks that's still our vision. We kind of would like it to look nice, though, wouldn't we? We don't want just more industrial-looking stuff. And yet, we have to accommodate industrial-looking things here. I believe that, um, uh, on, on that note, speaking personally, there's not enough room here to do uh, more light industrial work. Um, a beautiful piece of property just got absorbed by Death RV, all legitimately, for their RV storage. It's off-site, it's fine. Uh, but that means that uh, any light industrial work that could have gone there can't go there. And it's not against them, but it's also meaning that other kinds of things that bring more jobs might not be enabled. And these are difficult questions, and every community um, um, handles this kind of stuff, sometimes poorly and sometimes well. So I hope, again, with the living document, we can get through this and, 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 and make some good changes. And uh, I think we can call it right, we have to have requirements, I call it vision. But you know, what is the vision? It's hard to come up with all that, but at least we have some vision, and that filters down the requirements and uh, throw in dozen human-centered design. You know, we're trying to do things for people. Um, uh, we might just come up with some really good changes that are healthy and, and not negative. Okay, well, Ken, Ken was next, if you've still got your point. Yeah, Ken. yeah actually, uh, I, I still think a lot of this comes down to zoning because conditional use permits, uh, take, look at Blackfish, for instance, uh, resort commercial, Trying to put in a small hotel, a brewery, a distillery, restaurant, bakery, uh, all great things possibly for Point Roberts. Uh, jobs create, that will be created if it ever gets uh, moving along. The being on other projects, putting a septic in for 60 houses up at the golf course right now, their talk is about possibly putting in a uh, a uh, newer clubhouse with still a little restaurant like what they have, possibly a Chinese restaurant, some locker rooms for the golfers, and some hospitality suites because they can't put a, a hotel in uh, because of how they're zoned and conditional uses are uh, permits, are the, the money that it costs to, to go through that process and time. Um, if we had the, the marina, there was talk about uh, a hotel down there with the newer group of owners. It's not zoned properly for it. We we have these zoning problems. If we do, we we do need to do something in this next five months mm -hmm. to to get the county working with us. But once we're past this first hurdle, we're still going to have the people that had their knickers in the knot. Uh, going around and seeing who else they can get code violation reports filed on because that's the nature of those people. They uh, have their own little vision for this town. Uh, my family goes back to the 7th and 11th families to Homestead here. There has been some crazy different businesses that go, have gone on here. Uh, there was, there was uh, clam and fish canneries at one point. As I don't know if the Iron Chink is still out here. Yeah, uh, you know, the down at Wayland's, the old Wayland RV park down in Maple Beach, Boundary Bay area, there was once horse racing there and stock car racing on on the dirt. You know, there there have been lots of different things go on in this town. It, it, we used to have a roller rink uh, open down in, in Maple Beach. They're looking at restricting anybody's vision, in my opinion, is wrong. They bought the property, if it's permitted in county code, as a, as a use, 2072 is just extra restrictions that Point Roberts doesn't need, period. We, we still have things like, uh, we don't want AM radio towers, ever. We can put that in and cement that in somewhere that, that 
It'll never happen. We can protect ourselves that way. Yeah, we can. Don't shake your head no that we can't. We can do this. We can work forward to, yeah. to get these things done. You know, just that on, on that point, I'm a, rather an expert on the law and the FCC and all like that. And you can't say no radio tower. Just okay, clear. so we... we clear. That's why the hype, it turned out we tried to revise it and prove something we gave up. Our very expensive, wonderful lawyer, Bob Carmine, I'll find it, said, we're going to leave 2072 the way it is. Yeah, we can't. But just so you know, it, 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 but... but on that note, it's difficult just to say no because of special situations going on. You might be able to say no to other kinds of things. If, you know, okay. So maybe the way to approach it would be noise and traffic in terms of zoning. Put put the noise and traffic in as a condition of the zoning, so that in terms of permitting use of a property to to allow you know like future development in an area but you know as long as the noise doesn't get over certain decibels or something and the traffic is you know make conditional use with the neighbors to see if the noise or the traffic would be injurious to the neighbors then you know, you don't have to have a lot of restrictions in terms of this, that, you know, the nitpicky things. Okay, Georgia, maybe one of the next. I want to just, there's some folks in the room who haven't had a chance to speak. If anybody that hasn't had a chance to speak, who got a comment they want, I just want to give you the opportunity because the conversation keeps flowing. I'm fine. You're good? Good? Just let me know if, if something comes to mind that you wanted to speak up about. And George? I'm looking at the clock. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I've got a serious attitude for making things as concise as we possibly can make them. Uh, we are looking at timing as far as the zoning thing is concerned. It's critical that we take care of that. This is our primary set of goals. Vision and all the things having to do with the basis of the zoning is something that Mark Christonius has said in the email I got from, from David anyway. You guys hand us your zoning revisions in set before September, and then you can start talking about doing the revision of the said area plan. Because we can do the zoning, we can revise that, get it all done and hand it in, before we even start on this other business, which is a large undertaking. We won't have the kind of time restrictions that the zoning is laying on us. We won't have the sort of critical sort of now please come all over heads about certain stuff. Then we can start functioning with the new zoning. We can start functioning and making the projects we need to have happen. Happen. Start the process and the loop for projects and whatnot. So my suggestion is let's take what we've got today. What when is the next meeting? We are meeting on the nineteenth which is our planning meeting, mm -hmm. and all that FERCAC is going to deal with in that meeting is scheduling. Okay. And we're going to start laying out future special meetings mm -hmm. on this issue, and then the 21st is our regular meeting, mm -hmm. so we'll deal with regular agenda items that night, but by the 21st we'll be able to now um, other, other dates. Yeah. But I want to go directly to what you just said. I do have the Mark Personius email here, yeah. and although he says we acknowledge that the sub-area plan may be outdated, um, we, PDF, urge you, Point Roberts, to review the language in the sub area plan, but ignore, he's underlined it, ignore the out, outdated data mm -hmm. and look at 2072, yeah. which goes to fixed point. Yeah. Let's isolate the problem first, yeah. let's start working on what's important today, mm -hmm. and then we can, hopefully in five months, we can do a pretty comprehensive overhaul of 2072. Mm -hmm. I mean, although it's a short period of time, we, I think we've all said on a number of occasions it, it can be simple. So um, we could probably, I think we should take his advice and yeah, look directly yeah, to the yeah. We've done a lot in the last, last two months. Vision and community, community and progress is critical. So you may not get a complete overhaul, but you can get an iteration, right? Yes. yes, so we can live with the living document and change it you know, as we develop. 
I mean, uh, our board member from the Chamber of Commerce who could not be here today and has been working for well over a year and trying to get the Port of Bellingham and uh, County to help us with a new economic development plan because it is so outdated. And once we get these kinds of properly done research into what's available in Point Roberts, what are our geographical limitations, these reports can help you then. That's what the Saveria plan was built from, with the original economic development plan. That's outdated. The economic development plan is even more outdated. So once we have our problem addressed, then we can have the luxury of taking the time to get some funding for a proper economic development plan, redo the Saveria plan, and then go back to zoning afterwards. Okay, <clears throat> once you have that list of problems, Another suggestion for putting some structure on this, but I think there's a neat hierarchy here. I think the first one is corporate. A neat hierarchy. Oh, Great line. Mm -hmm. I think the first one is enabling essential services. So a place to store heavy equipment for construction, for septic services, for all the things in the point which it relies on and is sometimes deprived of. Um, the second hierarchy, or the second level of that, which I think would be economic. So jobs, the ability for people to support themselves here on the point. And then the third one is aesthetic. So any decision I think needs to balance those three, but I think there is a hierarchy there that will help put some structure on how to process the list of problems that you get. Great, great. Well, yeah. uh, a couple things. Yeah, one, we could probably have a lot of discussions once we have it. If we come up with a point of a hierarchy, what elements go where? <laughs> you know, some people clearly have focus on jobs, and that's entirely understandable because people have to be, <laughs> and also have to fulfill another job. Uh, but uh, for other people, it, it uh, may not be the top priority in this community. Um, another, thing I want, another point I wanted to make, something that we, and it's not present my the issues that George and Lauren and I guess uh, Doug had, and maybe a lot of people be involved. The time constraint we're under, as I understand it, is built entirely around the one year more plan, which they, or whatever they're calling it, um, that the county has offered in, in regard to that particular code violation. And I, I, as I say, I don't want to minimize that, but that's an odd thing to drive systemic change to an entire zoning system and the way we try to look at our community. Maybe we are, we are talking about trying to get something done in five months that may be entirely doable in five months, but we're trying to get something done in five months because that's how much time we have in order to get something into the county so we can have to make changes by a year from a few months ago or a month ago in order to avoid, if we make appropriate changes to the code, the, the violation that, that currently exists on Gulf Road. And as a as a uh, so as a first uh, principle matter, I think it's rather odd to, to sort of uh, legislate for a particular uh, poverty owner, um, which is sort of what we're doing. We're running this thing at a pace, which is fine while we try to run this pace because we can do it, get it over with at the best rate. But we're trying to run something at a pace that is really going to solve, as I understand it, one troublesome problem for some people in the community. And, and while I like all those people and would like to help them, I don't know that that's how we can best do things if, we, if we're trying to make comprehensive plans. I'm also not particularly keen, as I already mentioned, sort of on the idea of making a spot change just to avoid this problem and then have us come back to the whole issue of how to deal with 2072 and some very plan and all the things that are related to it uh, that we could then do after the fact, after the voting. It's, it's a very strange way to run our railroad, uh, as it were. Uh, we should be trying to do what's best for the community, and what, what's best for the community happens to also solve this problem, you know, all the better. But it's, it should be part of a whole, and that whole is what the, the thing we've been largely talking about at the meeting, which is what, what are the problems, whether it's a hierarchy of uh, needs or, uh, or some other uh, approach. Uh, we can address what we want to do, and then we can try to figure out how we implement it, and then hopefully it solves the problem on Gulf Road. But we're trying, the only reason we're trying to get this done quickly, and I don't know if you but the only reason we're trying to get it done quickly is because the county has given us, or given a, a property owner, uh, uh, some protection for a while, and we need to try, if we want to help them, we have to act properly, promptly to meet that goal. But again, it's a, it's a, 
It's a small item uh, driving a big uh, initiative, a big decision, uh, which we just need to keep in mind. And I'm not, I'm not, trying, to, I'm not trying to stick a, a, a company in the cause to, to mess up our process, but I want us to keep in mind that we're trying to do a really big thing, and we may be rushing it in order to accomplish, what is, in a sense, a, a little, to solve a little thing in the process. I'd like to respond to that, if I may. Um, I have been on this particular committee for three years, and we've been working on 2072 for three years. Mm -hmm. The previous board, uh, even when Arthur Reaver was the chair, so we're going back five years, I was attending meetings, and they were trying to work on 2072, mm -hmm. and uh, the, co the zoning and coding issues that were becoming apparent then for other developments uh, happening. And so I really appreciate your point, and I think that we should all remember not to ram this thing through because we're trying to accomplish one tiny little thing. But I think that the, the, that one issue with all of those particular businesses is probably the swift kick in the pants we, we needed. Because this thing, the, the whole character plan, that there was a subcommittee, they reviewed the entire character plan, they basically rewrote it, and then Perkak took it over and tried to, um, oh, we were doing things like removing commas and changing will to shall so that it wouldn't be so restrictive. And we spent another year. So I, I think that your point is well taken. We should definitely not rush it through based on one property that's having an issue, but I just wanted it for the record that mm -hmm. That these issues have been in existence for at least five years that I've been personally wow. coming to a to, to meetings, and so I think this, I think we should still remember that this is a, a, a very large initiative that we just haven't been able to everybody sit down and collaborate and gather ideas because it didn't seem important enough to everyone. Yeah. It was one of these ideas that was being worked on. And ideas don't bring, they don't bring everyone to the table. So thank you for that point and it's very no, well Thank you for saying that's exactly what needed to be said. And just a quick quick note, the, the boom ha about the, the character plan on all that, some, some were based upon relationships, some were based upon facts. Uh, uh, there wasn't enough facts, there wasn't enough actual work going on, five years going by. Um, and this is an advisory committee, and we couldn't get our act together really ultimately. And now we are. I think it's underway since starting last year. And I'm very happy to see it actually get underway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, I just need to say something sure. in directly in response to Stephen's yeah. statement. I'm the only person in the room that right now that was directly affected by that that by that zone uh, infraction. It's a very yeah. And I was surprised because I've been in the same location for over 12 years and never had any issues with the county or anyone. So when I got surprised by that enforcement action, I went, something's wrong. Not just with this little thing I'm dealing with. Something's generally wrong with the way the code has been put together. And so I took it on as a challenge see what I could do about fixing what I saw as a much bigger set of issues. Not just my own personal little problem, which I could have gone for. I could have asked for and paid for uh, a text amendment and probably had it go through. But I said, look, George, you live in a town with a lot of people who have way different ideas about all kinds of stuff. I don't see anybody driving the bus. You know, we've got this timeline between now and God knows what's going to happen to us in 10 years, and everybody's looking out the window or looking out the back window. And I'm like, look, I don't necessarily want to be the driver, but there's nobody behind the window. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, you want to stand out in the middle of the road and make it, you know, make a, a fool of yourself? Whatever. I'm trying my absolute best to fix something that I see is a major, major problem. We don't have a downtown. We don't have a, a village. And all this business is laid out in glowing colors in this sub area plan. What hasn't happened is any kind of substantive follow through. And there's reasons for that. 
Number one is that we've had things happen like 9-11 and blah, 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 blah. But the other thing is that we've got three people in a room, and the first thing that comes up is talking trash about some fourth person that's not there. <laughs> and I'm going, okay. I've heard people say, no good deed goes unpunished in Court Roberts. And I said, you know what? F that. I am so tired of hearing that statement. So if you want to be doing something about the town you're living and you have to get your assets off the chair and start putting them someplace where they make a difference. The one thing I have a lot of and I can do very well is run my mouth. Okay? And I've got a brain that can handle some pretty complex concepts. I love this place. I love all the contentious people in it. It wouldn't be the same town if it wasn't for these people. It's an absolute missionary, culturally, visually, economically, the whole works. And I said, okay, whatever. You got my hands on the wheel. You guys want to come along? <laughs> so that's why I got started on this mess. And I went to my good friend David and I said, David, I got a problem. You got a problem. Let's go see the county. Talk to the people in the county, long conversations, and they said, hey, you guys can fix this. Here's the deal. I'm like, wow, we can fix this. After the first meeting with Mark Personius, David and I walked over his truck and I said, David, we can pull this off. Are you ready? <laughs> the guy, so and so, and so and so, and so and so, and so and so, and then it's going to be a little bit of a cat herding process here. But I've been through cat herding 101. Earlier in my life, I've done a bunch of different stuff that involves technology, technical infrastructure, the whole work. So I'm not unfamiliar with what needs to happen here. My primary goal, first goal, is to fix the problem. If we, you can have all the ideas you want. I've got ideas coming out your ear, but if you can't take care of the other end, hello, we can't do anything. So infrastructure. Gulf Road is screaming for infrastructure. And things are in the works. So we have made a lot of progress over the last two months. We've actually gotten to this point Hello. since November when they were screaming at me that I had to move my trailers to some place. <laughs> like, hello, I can't. There's no other place. So yes, I felt a bit of pressure. And I responded to it the best way I could. I'm going to pop and say, hey, what do we do to fix this coming back to us? Rather than complaining to people and blah, 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 I went as far as I could go. I had a plan. Okay, so I'm working on things right now that can help. And I'll let people know when we go when things come further along. So anyway, that's where I'm staying involved. Thank you. It's important. It's Heidi. Important. Yeah, Heidi. Um, I want to say, uh, I mean, it's good that you brought up that it's getting us going, but um, I don't think a code violation, should, it, it, that's your problem, George, and here is too, is, is important, and, and you have a lot of communities who are wanting to help you with that. But I think Steve's point that the whole comprehensive have plan is what's the most important in that mm -hmm. case. And if we do make progress on that, I like Steve's point on that. Um, there may be an opportunity where the town gives us you and the others more time if we make progress. But the, the, the whole issue is a comprehensive plan, and, and that I think needs to be the focus. Of course. Yeah. Of course. But, but to George's point, he's the canar dead canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have someone that's not that much. Yeah. So my, my understanding is a little bit different as to what was driving the change. Um, it's not kind of in line with what George is saying, but essentially what I understood is there's been a lot of effort for a long time to take a comprehensive look at zoning, comprehensive look at the, the character plan, the economic plan, and all that stuff, right? Then you have this code violation issue that comes up and says, hey, we've got a, we've got a hard deadline to go address this. That put something on the front burner. That is actually a good thing in my mind. And I think it's actually driven a fair amount of additional involvement. So while we have the steam to do it, my general thought is along the lines of putting things into a hierarchy, you get the list of things in a hierarchy that 
that we need to have accomplished in the next five months. And that can be a pretty short list. Mm -hmm. And you do an iteration, you get the appropriate changes made, and I know that the folks at the county are not gonna wanna make change after change after change, but that I think if you were to come, with, come at them with, we've got three iterations or something like that. Iteration one is gonna be tier one, iteration two is gonna be tier two, iteration three is gonna be tier three. And tier three could encompass kind of everything in the, the longer term vision. So I think if you break it down that way, you can actually accomplish some really good things in a pretty short amount of time. And you let this code violation issue dictate the time frame and how much you can put into that first bucket. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just my perspective on it. And that's what I heard from a fairly decent number of folks that I talked to about it as well. Now, a lot of my information is very anecdotal in nature, but I can that one. Thank you for or bringing it to the table. Cool. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Dave. I agree with that, and I don't think you're going to make any progress until you actually get down to specifics. So I suggest that you, we have enough general visionary level discussion, and maybe we can start talking about some things. Great. Probably at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> because it, uh, I like your idea of reaching out to the public and asking them for their specific list. Yep. Let's start with um, gathering that information. And we've got the current code violation reports on the table, so we already know about those. Uh, we've been working on trying to uh, redesign well, this code and the uh, original iteration of the character plan for a number of years. So we have some of those uh, already on the list, like uh, the disappearing resort commercial because it's being used in commercial, which once it's used up, as you pointed out, it's light industrial. If it's used for something else, it was zoned for light industrial. There's no more of that left, and it's you know, can't make any more land. So. We do have to, um, so there are a couple things on the list, but it should, it contain a lot more very specific examples of, firstly, the problems people are experiencing or have experienced and been living with, and then secondly, the visions of going forward um, so that we can put everything, as uh, Rick just pointed out, into the hierarchy of what needs to be done in what direction. And then when we approach the county, we can say we've, we've done exactly that. We've created a hierarchy, the most the most uh, time sensitive, not important, you know, um, because green space is also really important, but it's not gonna be the top right now because we are being driven by this CDR issue. So it's no, no less important, but it'll be in a just a different order. Urgency, right? Urgency, that's what it's gonna be. So, go ahead. Okay, and for Rick a little bit, um, I think what the county says, Rick, is that, that um, um, really, they really don't wanna see us more than once a year. And two years is kind of what we like. Because they have to do a lot of work on their end. They have to go to town council. There's a lot of planning commission work they have to do. And all I have to get to is, we've actually seen it done in my experience with all personal, but kind of another process. And um, while they might entertain a, a text amendment or something in between a one or two year cycle, they really don't want it. That's, but yeah, that process. I wasn't implying that we would be able to do that on that yeah. cycle because, as you're probably seeing now, if we're trying to get something done in five months, we're yeah. kind of on an annual cycle at five months because we got to get yeah. it and it takes some years. Yeah. yeah, right. So your next iteration isn't for another year mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's presuming that we can somehow keep momentum behind this effort, which is very suspect. Without, without, <laughs> without something hurting issue, yeah. without hurting yeah. issue, which is probably come to this point. If there was a hurting issue after we submit this in, in uh, by August thirty first. Then I would personally vote for this committee to take up. Let's get another one for the next year. I'm okay with that. It means we got to do the thinking, got to do the work, and the consternation, and whatever else we have to do the outreach to do it. That's what we're here for. Right? Yeah. I mean, there might be something because obviously, like I was hearing what Kenny was saying about you know can't get the hotel here and that and all that. I'm very resonant with that, but I'm also kind of wondering. You know, it, it, we don't really have a, a god bean, if you will, who looks down and says, oh, I'm quite right, I don't put a hotel over here. And, you know, if this was great, one of these giant uh, things in Arizona that they used to know in California, in my case, I grew up in one, where somebody planned the whole damn thing from the very beginning. And sometimes it was kind of cruel, but, you know, I'm sure it had its problems. But uh, we don't have that. So um, that we have to both both listen to this business is having trouble with this. and. Here's a vision of what we like, and we don't want to lose this, and you know, the triangle of things, and, and somehow to come up with some answers about it. Okay. Heidi? I, I can 
prefer not to see hotels. <laughs> I actually like the the uh, um, Airbnb and the, the small uh, businesses um, providing accommod accommodation. So thanks for asking that. Yeah, no, but what if you looked at a hotel for the uh, three to four month lifespan here to see them? Yeah, it's yeah. not, so not, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, it's economically. Well, I am a traveler. So, so the whole notion of a hotel, zoning won't make a hotel happen. Zoning can only prohibit one from happening. Well, ultimately, make a hotel happen or not is somebody with the vision and the money to go invest in it. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to have to go put that effort in play, and they're going to have to figure out if they're business unit money. I mean, I can't imagine. You know anybody like I don't know Holiday Inn Express thinking it would work, <laughs> but you know it's not beyond a stretch to think that somebody could put in, you know, a, a, a fairly significant, you know, eight or eight or so unit kind of a, a lodging like that. Like that would actually you know. probably be okay. That's not beyond the realm of possibility. But again, that's not up to zoning. That's up to a business owner to choose to do that. Mm -hmm. So do you think you could say zoning can prevent hotels? You can break stuff, yeah, you can't fix yeah. things. You can just break them. Yeah. Well, we have a really you know, what apartment on, what was it, Marine Drive for years, okay? It's now, it's now just living quarters. Right, so it was, it was kind the of The fly and fish you're talking about? Huh? The fly yeah. and fish, the four yeah. flats? Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's an apartment, right? That's not a Yeah, it's hotel. now an apartment. This used to be kind of like a motel. You get it. But the economics dictated it's Okay. Okay. That's good. Uh, real quick, Jennifer Urquhart, who actually ran a I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars Marriott in in Maui? Somewhere in Hawaii. Yeah, Hawaii. Yeah, Hawaii. And and she says her analysis says that's one of the businesses that can succeed here. If it doesn't have 20 rooms. Uh, and I don't know what she meant by that. She mean 100 rooms or 20 rooms? Not too sure. But she said it could be profitable and very, very useful. Because I certainly could put up a few relatives there. Mm -hmm. And then we have Airbnb, you know, that sort of works here. Now that's a new thing that's just happened. Now I know my neighbors have put people up for some of using Airbnb. And that's saved a few um, holidays, I think. Yeah. Um, and also, just so everyone knows, I've been working with Maria. Um, trying to get what was would be out of race week, which has been in would be out for 31 years. Um, we are now putting our arms down to there was eight different places that were by for it. We're down to the top two. But it's between us and Port County. Mm -hmm. We actually have all the mm -hmm. area. They love it. Guess what we're missing? Okay. Accommodations of Accommodation. any sort. We're trying to work around that yeah. with by using because some of people RV, some of them tent. We're trying to work around that using some Airbnbs. And stuff, but where if we lose it, if he does, we don't have places for some of these people to stay. This is a week long event that brings over 400 people for a week. So for 100 fellows, minimum 400 people to be used. The mayor, the, the right now, it would be at a race week. Okay, and they're like, waiting for an event. I think you got the number of dead off mate. I'm just what I heard was a thousand people per week. I didn't hear four hundred. There's a the minimum four hundred. Two hundred votes is what I heard. They're right now at about. They're hoping to get two hundred votes right now. They're at about hundred. Okay. But they're estimating that we could possibly pull more because at Woodby Island they can't pull the votes from Vancouver. When if it was here in Point Roberts, we have all of these marinas that we can pull from in right. Vancouver. So they are going. We can go from a hundred votes. To 200 plus votes. If they only have the 100 votes, they said it's the minimum 400 people that come to the event. And that's just people basically on the vote. So I don't think I include all the spectators. The amount of money that brings in the community for everyone. These people who need to go to the grocery store, they're going to go to restaurants, they're going to go do all kinds of things, but we are missing one piece of infrastructure. So you and your marina conglomeration would support zoning that would allow for at least one small hotel. Well, I would personally anyway, because even just at the reef and stuff, we have people come all the time. I've never been to Point Roberts before. Where's the hotel we'd like to stay for the weekend? Yeah, um, I just wanted to bring it back to right. you know, support. We have that all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what we're zoning is. I hear it. 
probably four or five times a week in the summer. In the winter, I have my staff texting me. I have a couple that just came into town. They want a place to stay. I'm texting everybody I know who has an Airbnb to see if I can find a place for them to stay for the night. The problem is most of the Airbnbs over close for me shut down for that. So these people I'm sending them to school. Okay, Heidi? Um, I, I love that the Marina wants to do a sale event and that I'm just going around and get involved in the race in Alaska. Of course, Gavin has 1,500 uh, competitors. And um, we also do the, um, the raid. Um, and neither one of those groups requires a hook, but the Airbnb is small. Uh, groups would work excellent at those kind of things. And uh, we could get more of those races come as well. Um, so I think uh, a community website and, and places to find uh, local small accommodations would actually work and, and support those kind of races. But like I say, we've been quite involved since 2015 with uh, Race of Alaska with 1,500 competitors that can and stay in small spaces and uh, don't require a hotel. And uh, we could definitely help work with uh, your situation with the federal race. Okay. All right, folks, I think we're wrapping up. I have one more comment. Great. So the gentleman's comment is sort of like all this stuff, but I, I think it's a mistake to believe that any change that we make to our building code is going to change the business environment in Point Rock. Yep. We have a community of 1,200 or 1,300 or 1,400 full time people, and of course, we get our influx of maybe 3,000 or something uh, 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 visitors, maybe in the but we're at the point now. That's our population. We have an international border less than two miles from this where we're sitting right now. That is a huge impediment. The problem, I believe, is not zoning. I mean, there could be some spot things. I, I appreciate Kenny's point about the about the heavy equipment problem. Like all these people want, want to be there, want to do business for us, we'll get jobs done, but we don't want them to have any place to put their equipment. That could be a real problem just for the local, the local business, local zone. But I don't think any change we make here is going to put candy stores and shoe stores and ice cream shops and, and whatever, boutique stores all, all up and down Gulf Road with beautiful vistas uh, and, and whatnot. We are Point Roberts. We are small. We have a lot of population base that can support a much more economy than we have now, even, even though we don't love it. And we love, not necessarily love some of these cousins, but we might. There would be more vibrancy here probably. But it's not the zoning code, I would believe, that's holding us back. It's, being essentially a geopolitical island, and as small as that, but a very small population. So I, we can make certain changes that make sense for the community, but I don't think we should have the illusion that after we make these changes, we're going to have a different economy than we had before. It's, it can be it can be questions of septic, it may be other infrastructure things, but yeah, that's also what, that's what we are. We have the soil we have, we have the land we have, we have the amount of land we have. Anyway. I'll stop there. Let's not be too quiet, but we'll see what happens after we implement some well-made changes. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Just one question. Do you have a list of those uh, beautiful list of all the, what do they call it, community bio, uh, sorry, code violation reports? No. CERs? I don't, but uh, David Gladly did come to one meeting with a printout of them, so I know they're available. And one member of our board staff have that information. But I've never seen But they can't give it out. No. I can get it. Yeah. I was going to get one. I think because there's some privacy concerns or something, so it's not readily available. But I think we yeah. could give it to David or maybe Jeff Christopher. And, uh, yeah, I think it was actually Jeff Christopher. Yeah. So um, it could help in our discussion. And at one of the meetings, it was decided amongst the board at that meeting to turn it over and keep it private. It isn't about who and what. Yeah, maybe it's about, it's not about necessarily the names or the places. Yeah. It's more about like what Donna's saying, a canary in the coal mine. Yeah. And, and to help identify with what maybe some of the problems. Well, if we can reach out and those recipients of the CDR are willing to share their experiences, then we would slowly gather the list we're looking for. What kind of problem is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, we know of them. Yurts and houses that had to be taken down after people lived in them for 30 or 40 years. We know of those specific examples because they came to PERCAC meetings and shared their experiences. But I think I can name maybe 10 of those, and there were a lot more than 10. So it would be like the outreach effort would convince those people to come and share their experiences so that we could isolate it would be part the problem. Of yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, uh, please stay involved.
please keep your eyes out for the future meeting. Um, your input is how this is going to work. Well, right now, they're buying it from our two wonderful teams. So, Greg, you can all get to the But I'll be sure those are the legendary. Hey, David, what were you making? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put all this. So, 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 I'm going to put all